Okay, so I spoke a lot in that last screencast and got very little accomplished in terms of the notes. I apologize to you. And right now we're going to pick up where your notes should be filled into about somewhere around over here. Talking about resistance to weathering and all that other fun stuff. So instead of using screencast program, I'm now using Wii Video. So this would be considered a Wii Video screen capture. So a slight difference there. So again, apologies, very, very sorry. So if you look at your notes, let's just kind of go through this right now. That under letter D right over here, factors affect the rate and type of weathering. And it says an object is blank resistant to weathering. If it does not weather that much, it would be more resistant. And then an object is less resistant to weathering if it weathers easily. All right. When we talk about exposure, we talk about surface area, how exposed the rocks are to air, water, and actions of living things. Uh, the closer rocks are to Earth's surface, weathering will, and the answer would be increase. As humidity increases, the rate of chemical weathering increases. As the variation in temperature changes from below freezing to above freezing increases, the rate of physical weathering will also increase. Remember, you wanted to freeze, melt, let allow more water to come back in again and then refreeze that's when you're going to have the most ice wedging so i'm going to switch to the google slides right now which is a pretty decent size and we already went over that and this is about where we left off in the last one it's going to take some time for it to load up so anybody know any good knock knock jokes i guess not yeah, knock knock no bell no bell that's why i knocked uh, pretty lame. I know it. I'm um, just waiting for it to load up because this bar on the bottom will actually get in the way later on with some of the graphing. So factors affecting the rate and type of weathering. We have exposure, right? Surface area, particle size, mineral composition, and the climate. So certain minerals are more resistant to weathering or less resistant to weathering. And whatever the uh, object is made up of compositionally will affect its rate of weathering. So if we look at this little graphy poo in your notes, the rate of weathering versus surface area. So if I increase the surface area, if I make that surface area larger, well, then my rate of weathering is also gonna increase. That would be a direct relationship. Right. As exposure increases, weathering will increase. As humidity increases, the rate of chemical weathering will increase. That's a direct relationship. So more humidity will increase the rate of chemical weathering. If you increase the surface area, you'll increase the rate of weathering. And there are some really fabulous uh, illustrations over here. Wow, look at that. Talk about technology, huh? So the larger block that has that is without being broken into smaller pieces, it's less surface area, therefore it would take longer to weather. Uh, the one that's all broken up over here, even though compositionally, let's say they're exactly the same, the same volume, same mass, but because this has more surface area exposed, it's going to weather at a quicker rate, which is why we chew our food. We chew our food with our teeth. So we're breaking it down physically. There's also a chemical reaction that happens from your saliva. Ew, saliva. I know it's gross. But, and then when the food goes into your stomach, down your esophagus goes into your stomach, because we chew our food, there's a larger surface area for that food. It's easier for your stomach to digest or start the process of digestion to um, assimilate those calories for what it's needed or proteins and fats and uh, carbohydrates to give you energy. The more piece of rock is broken into, the greater the surface area, the larger the surface area, the greater the greater the rate of weathering. Easy for me to say. So that would be that example right there. You could see that it's a direct relationship, that graph. Now, it took us forever to come up with these drawings because they're really outstanding. And the names, sample A and sample B. We had a committee, then we had a subcommittee, and then we had a sub-subcommittee, and we met for about eight years, and we finally came up with these names, sample A and sample B. So the diagram below represents equal masses of two identical rock samples. Sample A is one large block, while sample B was cut into smaller, four smaller blocks of equal size. Sorry, skipped a word. If subjected to the same environmental conditions, sample B will weather more quickly than sample A. The best explanation for this is that the, what's the right choice? Abe, say, or day. 
sorry, it's speaking a little Spanish there. So A, B, C, or D, which one do you think it is? The volume of sample B is greater than that of sample A. Well, if you go back to the boring stuff, you could see that they're the same volumetrically, uh, the same material. So surface area of sample B is greater than that of sample A. Well, that's certainly true. More of it's exposed. And we talked about surface area. The more surface area exposed, the greater the rate of weathering. So we know the answer is B. We don't even need to go on. But dance, density of sample A is greater than that of sample B. Well, it's saying they're identical materials. Therefore, we know identical samples would have the same density. So that's not necessarily true. The hardness of sample A is greater than that of sample B. We haven't gone over that yet. That's related to minerals, but we'll go over that, tackle that later on in the year. So the mineral composition, the property of the mineral will affect the rate of chemical weathering. Marble and limestone dissolve in slightly acidic water. You could see that it's a whole big thing we're going to be doing later on rocks and minerals. And so page 16 of the Earth Science Reference Table shows you that certain minerals dissolve in acid and then marble and limestone have that material in it. Quartz does not react with most chemical substances. So quartz is like the sand you find on the beach. That's, that's quartz. Climate, chemical weathering most pronounced in warm and moist climates. High humidity and high temperatures. Physical weathering is most pronounced in cold, moist climates, especially in climates with temperatures that vary to repeated melting and refreezing, which we've already talked about, but you probably love hearing it. Dry climates experience more physical weathering, such as abrasion. Think about, you know, you look at rock formations in dry areas, they're very they have a very characteristic look because of the type of weathering that occurs. So the block diagrams below show two landscape regions labeled A and B. What is the most probable cause of the difference in the surface features between A and B? And if you look, you can see the rounded hills in A and B is more sharp and angular. So we would know that, well, just looking at it, we'd say A is probably more humid and B is definitely dry. So let's look at the choices. Choice one, A is a result of a humid climate or B is a result of a dry climate. That's certainly true. A is at a high elevation while B is located at sea level. There's no indication of that whatsoever. Uh, a is a plateau region while B is a mountainous region. We haven't gone over a dynamic planet yet, so that's probably a little bit more harder to eliminate as a choice. A is composed of igneous bedrock while B is composed of sedimentary bedrock. We haven't gone over that yet, but the patterns here are showing you what the rocks are made of, and there's a little key that you could actually look at on your science reference table. See that again? We haven't gone over rocks yet, so that's that makes that one a little bit more challenging to eliminate, but believe me when I tell you the answer is one. Cool. Oh, this is always so much fun. Weathering determined by climate. And you could see there's a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on over here. Approximate limit of possible temperature slash pre precipitations conditions on earth. So this is, this line represents that limit. In other words, you can't have a negative 10 and have 175 centimeters of precipitation. It just doesn't happen on the planet earth. So the amount of chemical weathering will increase if. So let's kind of help ourselves out here. Now let's just look for chemical weathering first. Moderate chemical weathering with frost action. Strong chemical weathering. Moderate chemical weathering. So what would we want it to increase? We'd want to be in the strong chemical weathering section. Would I want to have a air temperature to decrease and precipitation to decrease? It doesn't sound right. Air temperature decrease and precipitation increase. Again, we're in this section where we're looking at higher temperatures and we're looking at high precipitation. Air temperature increases and precipitation decreases. Again, we want more precipitation. So the, the correct choice is D. Air temperature increases and precipitation increases. Number two, which type of weathering is most common where the average yearly temperature is five degrees Celsius? and the average yearly precipitation is 45 centimeters. So I have to go to five degrees Celsius, and 45 would be between, be just below the 50. So I'm gonna see some slight frost action. See how that works? Right over there. So the answer to two is D. All right, products of weathering. We get sediments, solid particles from weathered rock fragments. Um, you could use page six of the earth science reference table to fill in your particle sizes. That's the part of your notes that you can do right now. So looking at that page six of the earth science reference table, and you could see you're going to fill in your notes here. So clay ranges from, and if I find this, I could see right over here that, of course, the thing's slightly in the way. My clay 
right, would range between this and this. So I would look at 0.0001 to 0 0.0004 centimeters. So then I would write that in my notes right over here. You can see that? And then silt. Silt ranges from 0 0.0004 centimeters to uh, 0 0.006 centimeters. And then sand would be anything from 0 0.006 centimeters to 0 0.2 centimeters. Pebbles would be 0 0.2 centimeters to 6.4 centimeters. Cobbles would be 6.4 centimeters to 25.6 centimeters. And boulders would be anything greater than 25.6 centimeters. But you don't have boulders there, so you could just kind of pretend I didn't say that. So just a little quick little thing there for you to help. Going back now to your notes, which graph best represents the chemical weathering rate of a limestone boulder as the boulder is broken into pebble-sized pieces? So you're obviously going from a larger item, a boulder, breaking into pebble-sized pieces, right? And that's from that Earth Science Reference Table page that we could see we're going from a boulder this size to pebbles. So we're going to be increasing our surface area. So what's going to happen to the rate of weathering? The rate of weathering will increase. So when I'm bolder, I'd be at a slow rate of weathering. And as I get to the pebble size, it would increase my rate of weathering. So that would be choice A. Now, when we get to this next part of the notes with colloids, dissolved ionic minerals, all of these things, this gets to be a, a little bit cray-cray, as you kids would say. But don't get overwhelmed by it. Last year, you should have done something with a colloid with light. When you took like a container of water, put sand and silt and clay and you shook it up and then you tried to shine the light through it and the light kind of got dispersed. That's because the colloids, it doesn't dissolve in it. They're in suspension. So there's a picture there of a, a canoe in a river and you could see the, you could see the dirt in the water. It's not, the, the dirt doesn't dissolve in it. Some, some aspects of it does, but the dirt itself, the sand particles, let's just say, they're suspended and that would be a colloid. All right now think about that stuff going down a river that stuff that's in colloids rubbing over rocks will weather and erode rock material so that dissolved ionic minerals minerals that have been dissolved in solution that's different than a colloid so this is how our oceans became salty believe it or not it came from the rivers uh, freshwater rivers so it's kind of an interesting little thing at least i think it is soil formation the materials from which soil is formed is called the parent material that makes sense. It's kind of cool. Soil that's formed has different layers and horizons. You probably know it if you've ever dug a hole in your life. If you haven't, you're really missing out. Um, and mature soils have more layers. Immature soils have less than two layers. And look at the diagram to see how soil develops. And now that's going back to your um, notes. But you have bare rock. And this is something called succession. And so this is happening over time. So you have bare rock. Then you have lichens come in, or lichens, some people say. Then you have small annual plants. That starts to break down the rock even more. Root action, all the things we talked about, right? Biological activity. Then the, that becomes grasses. Then the grasses graduate to shrubs and, and shade-tolerant trees. And then you get what's called, a, eventually you'll get a climax community, but you can see the soil is getting deeper each time. Um, and there would actually be different layers here, wouldn't just be the same. And you can see on the bottom, the time frame is hundreds of years. So it's a pretty interesting thing that happens. And this is idealized soil profile. So you have, it's kind of nice. You have soil A, B, C, that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about the E horizon. You don't have to worry about that at all. Um, and you're just looking at topsoil, which you probably heard of before, and then subsoil, and then the, the bedrock <clears throat> below it is the parent material, right? So, and then you have different types of soil. You have residual soil when it's the same composition as the parent material below it, you know that soil was born there. So you might be a resident of Syosset or a resident of Woodbury, right? Um, transported soil, it wasn't made there, but it was transported there. So glaciers did a lot of transporting of soil. Wind can do it, right? Um, you know, there's, material that goes from the Sahara Desert and winds up landing in Brazil and uh, helps fertilize the um, rainforest there. It's kind of interesting, right? Well, maybe not a few, but it is for me. So the composition of the bedrock below it is not the same as the soil above it. Therefore, it means it had to have 
be transported there. It formed somewhere else and then was transported there. So when Long Island was one of the biggest things Long Island was when it first was established was sold a ton of topsoil. People came here to get topsoil. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another screencast by your earth science teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to look into soil formation. If we look at this picture right here, we can see there's a number of different things in it. We have some leaves, some grass right here, and then also what appears to be some sediments. The end result of weathering and biologic activity is soil. So when we saw the leaves and the grass, that's all biologic material, or those plants could have been doing something to the soil. And we also saw sediments, and we know that sediments are the end result of weathering. So we combine them, we get soil. Soil formation, so we start with the breakdown of rock in an area, generally bedrock. And what will happen is either through chemical or physical weathering processes will break down, and we can see that right here. As it breaks down, the sediments pile up. So we can see here, there's a pile up of sediments. And ultimately what's gonna happen is that as these sediments are gonna pile up, we have organic material also up on top or plants growing. As the plants grow and possibly die, they'll contribute more organic material to the top. The organic in this situation here is once living uh, organisms or material. We have a number of different soil horizons or soil layers. We have the O up on top, which is our organic layer containing all of our plants right here. Then we have A, our topsoil. And you can see that as we go down, the colors change a little bit. So this region right here is our topsoil from here to here. Rotting plants, organic, and finely weathered rock. We have a B horizon. And you can see here, it's mostly the same color. Little organic material, right? We're farther away from it. Partially weathered rock in this region. As we get to the C, or the regolith, we can see that it's some bedrock broken down into bigger pieces. And then finally a D horizon, which is bedrock right here. Sometimes you'll have all these layers, sometimes none. It depends on the area, but in a typical region where we have the breakdown of bedrock and with given enough time and little disturbance, we'll get the sediments to pile up with organic material up on top. Here, this person made a cross section these and marked the different horizons. So you can see here with these little T's, they marked the number of different soil layers that we have in here. Okay, as we get to the top, so we had have our organic layer right here, A for topsoil, B, C, and I think the D is way down here. There are probably a couple layers off, but there's definitely distinguished differences between these. Soil types. There are two major types of soil. We have transported and residual, and pretty much the names give their, uh, what to their soil type away. Transported soils are soils that have been carried by wind or water from location of the parent rocks. That means it weathered, broke down, and then something moved it. Most of New York soils is actually transported soil that was brought by glaciers. Once again, trucks coming in, backfilling into areas, transported soils. They're not from where it originally broke down. Then we have residual soils. This is where bedrock is broken down, the sediments pile up on top, and they stay there. So when we see in residual soils, it actually has the same composition to the bedrock below or the parent rock from which that material broke down or weathered. This is just a map of the different soils around the United States. And we're gonna go into something similar like this in class. I hope you enjoyed it. That's it for weathering. Take care. Okay, so we're going to go over again soil horizons and we're going to fill in this part of your notes here. So let's take a look at this diagram. It shows us all of these layers of the soil. So let's take a look. They call them soil horizons. A is also called, take a look at our diagram here, A is also called topsoil. It's usually darker 
It contains, we like to call it hummus. Now we're not talking about crushed chickpeas here. We're talking about organic material. Okay. So it could be um, decaying leaves. It could be animal stuff. We'll leave it there. Okay. But that's your organic material that, that helps for plants to grow and fertilize the soil. Then we have layer B. And layer B, as you can guess, since it's labeled, is called your subsoil. This contains material that have been washed down from soil horizon A. As we learned from infiltration, we have rainwater that will infiltrate the soil, percolate down. So material from the topsoil will percolate down to the subsoil. Then you have layer C, and that is your parent material. It has slightly weathered material. Directly below it, we have our bedrock. That's our solid layer. All right. So now that we have our layers labeled for us and we filled that in, let's take a look at the question here in the notes. Let's read it. So, Well, you can read it. After you read it, we're going to answer which changes would most likely cause soil layer to increase in thickness. So we want the soil layer X here, which as we discussed from this diagram, that's really our topsoil. You can see the plant roots that come down here in our topsoil. So we're kind of looking at the same thing here, our topsoil right here. And we want to increase the thickness of it. Take a look at the question and see which one you think would increase the thickness of the topsoil, which contains organic matter. should come up with answer C, an increase in biological activity. Now, biological activity, again, we said could be animals. It could also be roots um, because we know that plants break up rocks through, through the roots can break up the rocks. Yeah, I'm stuttering. That's great. And that's about it. Okay.